In this tutorial, we're going to talk about how to trace optical power through a system of polarizers and wave plates. And I specifically want to consider the case where we're starting off with random polarization. So let's consider some randomly polarized light source. And we're going to send this through three generic optical elements. So first, we're going to send this beam of light through a polarizer. And that's just going to be generically polarizing the light at some pass angle theta 1. Then the light's going to continue on. It's going to then hit a wave plate. And we'll place this in the coordinate system of the lab so the axes line up with x and y. And then we'll keep going. And we'll pass it through a final polarizer which is going to be at some other angle, theta 2. And f then the light will emerge from that. So we know that there's an intensity I0 at the beginning. And what's the intensity when it comes out? The interesting thing about this problem is how y we keep track of intensity and also keep track of electric field and when do you do which. So I'm going to write two columns, two rows here and I would encourage you to do the same when you work problems like this for intensity and for field. And um, what we can say is that at the beginning we know that the intensity here is clearly I0. So then I go through the first polarizer and let's be explicit about the fact that we're considering a point here. We're going to call that point A. And we can say, well, now we have some intensity here after the polarizer. We're going to call it IA. And what do we know about IA? Well, we've got randomly polarized light going through a polarizer. Whenever you do that, you get exactly half the power through. So we now can say that we know what IA is. It's I0 over 2. Now, what would we say about field at this position? It's not that there isn't an electric field, of course, but it's not a polarized state. It's not a state where the x and y components have a definite phase relationship relative to each other. We might also say it's not a coherent state. It's a random state. So we can't really say anything about the field writing it as a Jones vector here. So I'm going to write not applicable. And please don't think that that means, again, that there is no electric field, but we can't write it in terms of a Jones vector. And that's what I really mean in this Optics 262 class when I talk about writing the field. So now, however, we have an electric field EA. And now there's a definite state here because we passed it through a polarizer. It's a polarized state. So this, the field is EA times a unit vector. And just for being precise about it, we know what that unit vector is. It's cos theta 1 sine theta 1 if it's a linear polarizer. And the real important thing about this is just that it's a unit vector. I'm not going to keep track of what the state is as we continue to go through the rest of the system. But remember, this is a unit vector. Now we go through a wave plate. All right, so now that I've got a field, let's work in terms of field. The next thing to do is to say that the field at B, what's its amplitude going to be, and what's its unit vector going to be? Well, for the points of this problem, the point is to say that e electric field strength at B is the same as the electric field strength at A. The wave plate doesn't absorb any light, and it doesn't add any light. It just changes the relative phase of the x and the y components to each other. So I, even though I'm considering point B, I'll still call this field strength EA. And what's changed now is that it's not the same unit vector. So I'm literally just going to write unit vector here to, to keep track of that. But I don't at the moment care what it is. We'll work an example in a few minutes. I don't even try to write what the intensity is up here. I'm not concerned about that yet. I'm going to keep track of electric field now that I've got a fully coherent state. So let's move on. We go through a polarizer. And now we consider at point C, that's essentially our output point where we can calculate the intensity on the way out. So let's again 
it, once we know the electric field, keep track of electric field. So we've got EC here. Now EC, and again we will say unit vector, it's not the same unit vector as here. But for now, just think of it as it's some new electric field strength EC, because probably not all of this field is going to get through. It's a polarizer after all. And it, this is just a generic way of writing electric field at C. But we can make a comment about this. We can say that this is going to equal EC is going to equal some scale factor alpha times EA. That's not a controversial statement. It simply says that there was a certain electric field strength back here, a linearly polarized state, and by the time it gets to this through the second polarizer, it's probably alpha could be one, but it could be a number, it could be zero. It's some number between one and zero, and that's the strength of the electric field at C. It's not as strong as it was at A unless alpha equals one. And now we can go and ask, well, what is the electric, what is, sorry, what is the intensity at C? because the intensity at C is I out, and that's going to equal what? Well, let's, let's pause for a second and write a box here. Okay, so in general, we know how electric field is associated with intensity. That comes from the pointing vector. We know that the intensity, what we have elsewhere called S, the pointing vector, it equals in free, in empty space, in vacuum, this a speed times one half epsilon naught, and then we sometimes say electric field squared. We've said it different. We say it various different ways. We could say e dot e star, uh, where these are the magnitudes of these quantities out here, which might be complex numbers. But what we can observe is that this is equal to some overall constant, which I'm just going to now call kappa, and then times the electric field squared. And, and for the purposes of this derivation, I'm going to just write it as E squared, assuming that E is not a complex number. The insights that you're getting here are the same even if E is a complex number, and I had to write this a little differently. The intensity is proportional to the electric field magnitude squared through some value kappa, and kappa is the same throughout the entire problem. As long as I'm thinking about making the measurement in, in, empty, in air, then the power is the same here as it is here as it is here in terms of the proportionality between I and E squared. So now I know what this is equal to. IC is equal to this value kappa times EC squared. And of course, IA must be equal to kappa times EA squared. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that notice I haven't done anything to calculate an electric field here. I'm going to, in fact, write this instruction out. If the problem is asking you what the intensity is on the way out in terms of what it was on the way in, don't calculate a number for E. You're not being asked to get a calculated number for E. Usually in experimental situations, we're not going to directly measure the electric field. We're going to measure average intensity. You could do it. If you know the intensity on the way here at this point A, you could, of course, run right to this equation, plug in these constants, and solve for E squared. You could do that. What I'm trying to emphasize to you here is that you don't need to. You don't need to calculate a number for E. What do we want to know? We want to know the output intensity, IC, equals, well, we said it was kappa EC squared, which we know because EC is some fraction of EA, equals kappa alpha EA squared. But then I can put the kappa and the EA, EA together. I can bring the alpha squared out in front, and then I get kappa EA squared. And kappa EA squared equals IA, so that's alpha squared IA. 
So you can now see that the output intensity is related to the intensity at A, and the intensity at A is related to the input intensity. So this is equal to alpha squared I naught over 2. So the take home messages from this are first of all, don't forget the factor of 2. A lot of people so f that I've seen in the class so far have forgotten about the fact that you lose half the power when you go through this polarizer. You have to always take that into account. So usually if you start off with randomly polarized light, you're going to have this factor of 2 related to the fact that you couldn't start the Jones analysis until you'd already lost half of your power. And then you simply have to figure out what the ratio of the output field is to the first point where you could specify the field where it wasn't not applicable but you could actually write a coherent state and that value alpha gives you the rest of the information you need to calculate the output power. So let's work an actual example here. Let's suppose that we have I naught equals 6 milliwatts per centimeter squared just to be very concrete it goes in and the first thing it does is it goes through a polarizer at plus 45 degrees the next thing that it does is it goes through a half wave plate at 20 degrees and then it goes through a polarizer oriented at positive 30 degrees. And we want to know, and this is randomly polarized light at the beginning, just like the problem up here above. We ask ourselves, what is here at A? We know that IA equals I naught over 2. And this is the first point at which we can write EA and we have some magnitude EA and then we have a unit vector which is 1 1 over root 2 since it pl passes plus 45 degrees so now we've got an electric field so let's let's follow that along once it goes through the half wave plate at 20 degrees it's gonna flip before the 45 degree state by a total of 50 degrees EB is going to be that value of here's at this point we're going to have the same electric field amplitude because it's just a half wave plate but the state started off at 45 degrees the half wave plate is here at 20 degrees so the output state is going to be down here at minus 5 degrees, 25 degrees here, 25 degrees here. So it's cosine of minus 5 degrees, sine of minus 5 degrees. So that's our state here. What's the state at C? Now we have a polarizer at 30 degrees. So I'm going to be very explicit here. I've got cosine 30 degrees, sine 30. This is a case where I really recommend that you write out the polarizer uh, cosine 30 degrees sine 30 degrees I recommend you write it out as a column times a row vector and then the state that you're multiplying it by is this state here running all of that together we're going to get a magnitude EA then there's the dot product of these two when you analyze this dot product you get cos cos plus sine sine and by a trig identity that becomes co the cosine of 30 degrees minus negative 5 degrees so this becomes the cosine of 35 degrees which of course is the angle difference between this polarizer and the linear state that's coming in and then we have a unit vector cos 30 sine 30. So in order to calculate what the intensity is, the intensity at location C, 
I know it's going to be the input intensity divided by 2. That's what gives me IA. So it's going to be I naught over 2, which of course is 3 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then we have to we have to figure out what this decrease factor is. Well, the decrease factor is the cosine 35. I have to square that. So cosine squared of 35 degrees. This cosine squared term is, of course, what we all walked into Optics 262 knowing. We, if you have ever heard a name for it, you would probably say it's Malice's Law. This cosine squared is coming about because you have a polarized state at minus 5 degrees being passed through a polarizer at 30 degrees, and we all know that the cosine squared of the angle between a linear input state and a linear polarizer producing an output state, you just simply square the cosine of that angle, and that tells you how much power it gets through. Here you see it emerging from the actual analysis. So to summarize, we've calculated the power, the intensity at location C in terms of an input power. It's going to be that input intensity divided by 2 because of the loss at the first polarizer. At this point, it becomes a problem that we can trace the electric field all the way through the system. We notice that at the end of the problem, the electric field at C is weaker than the electric field at A by a factor of cosine 35 degrees. That's the factor, that's the factor of alpha here. So we square that and indeed, you get cosine squared 35 degrees. In this case, very much like Malice's law. If it were a more complicated system, though, this might be some more complicated expression. Nevertheless, that, that expression is still what you square in any case. This is a general strategy for solving problems like this. And one last time, notice that you never had to grind out an electric field value anywhere. You start off being told the logical experimental quantity, which is I the intensity on the way in. The logical me measurement at the way out is also an intensity. Electric field is a logical way to keep track of what's happening in the intermediate parts of the problem. But if you're never being asked to calculate the electric field, then don't ever calculate it. Just use it as a variable. And at the end, convert back to intensity.